Check out these performances from the Jimi Hendrix experience and the multi-track master of Little Wing. The bold swing of Mitch Mitchell on drums. The bluesy directness of Noel Redding on bass. And of course, Jimi Hendrix. The unmistakable riffs. And the one-of-a-kind vocals. Well, she's walking through the clouds. The Jimi Hendrix Experience was a guitar, bass, and drums power trio, and they had a radical impact on rock between 1967 and 70. Along with Eric Clapton and Cream, you know, the Hendrix Experience was pretty much synonymous with that late 60s blues rock and psychedelic experimentation. Now, for me, there's no other Hendrix song as original, subtle, and short that captures the essence of what made Jimmy's music magical and influential. I'm talking about Little Wing. So stick around as we go inside this very brief but everlasting recording. Thanks for being here. Time to blow up the song. Fly on. Welcome back to the channel and blow up the song number five. In this series, I blow up the final mix of important songs and recordings to expose what's underneath, isolated tracks and stems. The idea is for you to hear the building blocks of classic arrangements, performances, and recordings. So if you haven't yet, take a second right now to like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you always know about new episodes. Okay, so far, we've blown up the Beatles, the Stones, the Who, the Doors, some of the most important bands of the 60s. But I can't leave out Jimi Hendrix and the massive influence he had on all of those other bands. And it's a great excuse to pull out my son Eli's awesome 1987 Fender Strat. This is an American standard, and it was one of the first post-CBS guitars built in the Fullerton factory. So, you know, you can almost feel the employee pride, the aura of employee pride. Most people don't realize that in just four years, Hendrix evolved from being a backup guitarist, who was barely scraping by, to being the highest paid performer in the world. He headlined at Woodstock in 69 and the Isle of Wight in 1970, and then he was gone. September 18, 1970. R.I.P. Jimmy. That whole evolution happened so quickly. I mean, Jimmy and his bandmates, Noel Redding and Mitch Mitchell, really took the London music scene by surprise. Late 1966, they play a gig at the Bag and Nails nightclub in London, and in the audience were Jeff Beck of the Yardbirds, Eric Clapton of Cream, Mick Jagger and Brian Jones of the Rolling Stones, John Lennon and Paul McCartney of the Beatles, of course, and Pete Townsend of The Who, all in the same audience. Kevin Ayers of Soft Machine was there, too, and he described the crowd's reaction to Hendrix as stunned disbelief. So all these stars are watching Hendrix and they're just dumbfounded. They're actually swearing under their breath, like how the <clears throat> are we supposed to compete with this guy? Based on that one gig, the record mirror called Hendrix for an interview, and when they published it, the headline just said, Mr. Phenomenon. So Jimmy was obviously a guitar virtuoso, and everyone did kind of an extra double take because he played a right-handed Fender Strat, strung left-handed. But it wasn't just technical ability. Um, it was also his experimentation, because he got these radical new sounds from his guitar, his amp, and just a few primitive pedals. He had effects like distortion from a fuzz face, he got feedback from his Marshall Stacks, played octaves with his Octavia pedal, wah-wah from a Vox pedal, and phasing effects from a Univibe, and sometimes from a Leslie speaker, you know, which has that rotating speaker and Doppler effect. It also didn't hurt that Jimmy came off as an international man of mystery because he had this fully developed stage persona and theatricality. So he had what I think of as a psychedelic military fashion style. And he definitely raised the bar of pure entertainment on guitar. 
you know, with tricks like playing with his teeth or lighting his guitar on fire like he did at the Monterey Pop Festival in 67. So it seemed like Jimmy had come out of nowhere. Everyone in London was wondering, where did this guy come from? Well, Johnny Allen Hendricks was born in Seattle, 1942. Started playing acoustic guitar at 15, got his first electric and played his first gig at 16. And then he did a brief stint in the army, 1961, and then moved to Clarksville, Tennessee. And that's where his music career really started. And for about four or five years, he played this string of venues in the South known as the Chitlin Circuit. And during that time, he actually backed up Sam Cooke, Wilson Pickett, Jackie Wilson, Ike and Tina Turner, lots of others. And some of those artists opened for the Impressions, so he also got to know Curtis Mayfield, and he soaked up a lot of riffs and musical nuances from Curtis. Here's a quote from Jimmy. Curtis was a really good guitarist. I learned a lot in that short time. He probably influenced me more than anyone I've ever played with. That sweet sound of his. So in 64, Jimmy lands a spot in the Isley Brothers Band, and later he moves over to Curtis Knight and the Squires. So he was getting great experience as a sideman, but economically, he was barely making it. So 1966, he moves to Greenwich Village and forms his own band, Jimmy James and the Blue Flames. And they get a standing gig at Cafe Wa. One night, Chaz Chandler, bass player for the British band The Animals, shows up, sees Jimmy, and realizes what potential this guy has, right? So Chandler approaches Jimmy, convinces him to come to London, and becomes his producer and co-manager. Suddenly, Hendrix isn't Jimmy James anymore. He's James Marshall Hendrix, AKA Jimmy, with an I. And it's like his new name just makes him a whole new performer. He creates an almost mythological aura around the artist known as Jimi Hendrix. Okay, I know this is a lot of history, but hopefully you get the point that Jimmy did not come out of nowhere. All through his early 20s, he played with top-level artists and paid dues, you know? He polished his R&B chops, and he really developed his own style. He took typical chunky rhythm chords and broke them up into a new hybrid style, kind of halfway between rhythm and lead. So we're gonna come back to that later, and I'll try to show you why it matters. So Jimmy had this revolutionary influence on guitarists and on rock music as a whole. And in fact, Rolling Stone ranked him number one on their list of the greatest guitarists of all time. You know, there are endless concert recordings like Band of Gypsies, but during his lifetime, Jimmy only released a grand total of three studio albums. Are You Experienced, May 67, Axis Bold as Love, January of 68, and then the double album Electric Ladyland in October of 68. Think about that. His entire studio output hit the market in a period of 18 months. And here we are 50 years later, you know, still trying to process how much Jimmy and those three albums changed everything. Now, if you're a completist, Jimmy had recorded over 20 tracks for an unfinished fourth studio album, and songs from that came out in 71 on the albums Cry of Love and Rainbow Bridge, and then more came out in 72 on War Heroes, and another batch came in 2010, almost 40 years later, on Valleys of Neptune. And legend has it, there's even more stuff that's still unreleased. All right, let's grab those explosives and blow up Little Wing. Words and Music by Jimi Hendrix, recorded October 67 at Olympic Studios in London. Chaz Chandler producing and Eddie Kramer engineering. Track number six on the Jimi Hendrix Experience's second album, Axis Bold as Love. Released December 67 in the UK on track records, January 68 on reprise records in the US. So Little Wing is one of Hendrix's best known ballads. It made a big impact even though it was never released as a single. Uh, it's on Rolling Stone's list of 500 greatest songs of all time. Now, you may not have thought about this, but Little Wing is actually little. It's only two minutes and 26 seconds long. It's just an intro, two verses, and a guitar solo with a fade out. There's no bridge, no chorus, but obviously it had what it needed to become a classic and to keep growing in popularity and importance over the years. So let's look at the inspiration and the lyrics first. Back in 68, Jimmy said the idea for Little Wing came to him at the Monterey Pop Festival. He was just looking around at this kaleidoscope of everything happening, and he thought maybe he could personify it in the form of a girl. And he said, I'm gonna call it Little Wing, 
and it's gonna just fly away. In another interview, he talked about Little Wing as a specific woman. Now, I'm gonna paraphrase. You ride into town for the drinks and parties, you play your gig, these beautiful girls come around, you fall in love with them because that's the only love you can have. It's not always a physical thing. Little Wing was a very sweet girl that came around that gave me her whole life and more if I wanted it. And me with my crazy life couldn't get it together, so I'm off here and there and over or whatever. In another interview, he was asked about love, and he mentioned a specific woman from Sweden named Katerina. So, Little Wing is both symbolic and literal, and it's this interesting mix of idealism, beauty, and sadness. I think Jimmy is generally an underrated singer, and he never liked the sound of his own voice, which is sad to me. But let's listen to how beautifully and intimately he sings about this dreamy, almost angelic presence in his life. Well, she's walking through the clouds with a circus mind that's running wild. Butterflies and zebras and moonbeams and a fairy tales. That's all she ever thinks about. Riding with the wind When I'm sad She comes to me With a thousand smiles She gives to me free It's all right, she says It's all right Take anything you want from me Anything Anything. So she's a dreamer and she's the stuff of dreams. When he's sad, she brings him a thousand smiles, but there's still a sadness because he knows she's up in the clouds riding with the wind and she's gonna fly on. For me, the final master take of Little Wing strikes this ideal balance of delicacy and intensity to match the lyrics. Now musically, Little Wing is deceptively simple. What Jimmy plays on guitar sounds complex, but the chord structure is basic. Jimmy said he based it on a very, very simple Indian style. Pretty sure he meant Native American because he had some Cherokee ancestry. And there's another Axis Bold as Love irony. The album cover is a play on East Indian Hindu art, and it shows Jimmy, Noel, and Mitch as avatars of Vishnu. And when Jimmy saw it, he said, that's the wrong kind of Indian. Anyway, Little Wing is a simple eight chord pattern that repeats a total of five times. Intro, verse one, verse two, solo one, solo two, which fades out in the final mix. On guitar, it's played in E minor, but it's actually E flat minor, because when you try to play along, you realize Hendrix's Strat is tuned down a half step. So an E minor hand position is actually an E flat minor chord. So Jimmy pretty much kept his Strat tuned to E flat standard. And some people say that's because all strats sound better tuned down. That may be true to some ears. My guess is that it's just what Jimmy was used to, you know, both in terms of pitch and string tension. Because Jimmy played in a lot of R&B bands with horns, right? Saxes and trumpets are E flat and B flat instruments. Normally playing in those flat keys is a pain in the butt for guitarists because it's all bar chords. But when you tune down a half step, you can actually use E and B hand positions to play these horn friendly E flat and B flat chords. I'd also guess the half step drop made it easier for Jimmy to sing as a baritone. Just saying. Anyway, the chord progression of Little Wing is straightforward. E minor, G. A minor, E minor. B minor, B flat minor, A minor, C, G, F add nine, C, D. Everything but that little B flat minor transition and the F add nine chord falls within the standard key. The final recording uses fairly simple instrumentation too. It starts with Jimmy's solo guitar intro and a set of metallic bells called Glockenspiel. Story goes, he just saw him sitting on a shelf in the studio and said, let's try them.
Something that makes Little Wing especially cool and swaggering is the way both Mitch and Jimmy push the tempo around and they move fluidly from a straight rock feel of 8th and 16th notes to a more bluesy jazz influenced feel of triplet swing and they keep switching back and forth. So straight rhythm is all even beats, right? One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and, and triplet swing is a little more of a gallop. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. So Jimmy's intro starts straight. So that's really it's very but then he starts injecting little triplet hints like this. That that's the gallop. That that's straight, right? And then. Jimmy keeps moving subtly back and forth between the straight rhythm and swing. And then when Mitch comes in, his intro fill is all triplets, heavy swing feel. Noel keeps his bass part really simple. It's straight enough that Jimmy and Mitch can do whatever they want without the bass fighting them. So the basic tracks were a live take, and at one point, Noel makes a little mistake and just drops out for a couple beats and then pops back in when he knows where he is. I never even noticed this in the final mix. So earlier I mentioned the unique way that Jimmy broke apart rhythm chords into a rhythm lead hybrid. So listen to the verse when I play it with a standard approach to rhythm guitar. Well, she's walking through the clouds With a circus mind that's running around Butterflies and zebras, moonbeams and fairy tales all she ever talks about is riding with the wind. Now listen to what Jimmy does on the verse with all the chords broken apart into these intricate patterns and movement up and down the neck. He almost never plays a full chord without adding some little melodic variation to it. That's just so Jimi Hendrix, you know? Tons of imitators, but only one original. Now, Mitch pretty much stays with the triplet swing feel through both verses. Check out these triplet fills. But then when Jimmy rocks harder after the verses, Mitch switches over to straight rock fills, 16th notes like this. Okay, so the late 60s was really the heyday of power trios. You had Cream, Grand Funk Railroad, Blue Cheer, James Gang, and the Hendrix Experience. 
the core of this recording is the power trio, drums and bass, along with Jimmy's hybrid rhythm and lead. So let's take just a minute to relish the pure power trio of Jimmy, Noel, and Mitch laying down Little Wing's basic tracks. So the final production is just that power trio and three overdubs. The bells we heard before, Jimmy's lead vocal, which we also heard, and his lead guitar solo at the end, along with a few little vocal cues he wanted to add, you know, fly on little wing and yeah, yeah, little wing. Check it out and enjoy the extra few seconds of Jimmy's solo and the whammy bar ending that were unfortunately faded off from the album version. I actually love this ending. Fly on little wing. <laughs> Okay, I really wanted you to hear that ending. Unfortunately, I have tried to upload this video numerous times. I've tried editing it, cutting pieces in and out, whatever. It doesn't work. I'm getting blocked every time. So something about YouTube's algorithm, Sony Music Entertainment, the Hendrix Estate, they don't want their music to be heard, apparently. So I got an idea. Let's go rogue together. I am going to post, any anytime I run into this problem, I am going to post the complete blow up the way I intended it to be seen, and I'm going to put it over on my own hosting service where they can't mess with it. And all you need to do to get access to it is go to guitardiscoveries.com slash blowups, plural. Guitardiscoveries.com slash blowups. If you go ahead and give me your name and email address, it'll then take you to a page you can bookmark. That page is going to be where I put any videos like this that get blocked now or in the future. So, hey, join me over there. I think we can get around this nonsense. By the way, there's also some really cool interview footage with the original recording engineer, Eddie Kramer, that got cut or blocked because of YouTube's algorithm, too. So that'll also be in the complete video. I'll see you over there. After Jimmy died, Little Wing became the choice for big name guitarists and bands whenever they wanted to pay homage to Jimmy. And I think that started with Eric Clapton and, you know, Derek and the Dominoes right after Jimmy died. They did a classic version of Little Wing on the Layla album, and they played it in their live shows, too. Well, and then there's Jeff Beck. Sting. Well, she's walking Stevie Ray Vaughan, who won a posthumous Grammy for his version. And John Mayer. I mean, it's a who's who. You know, they're keeping it alive, and, and my hope is that Little Wing will fly on forever in the hands of great guitarists. All right, please take a moment to comment. Share what Jimmy and his songs and Little Wing mean to you. Don't forget to like the video, leave a comment, pass it along to other Hendrix fans. It really helps. I really appreciate you being here to blow up these songs. And when you watch and comment, it just means the world. Of course, it would be even more amazing if I had your support on Patreon for whatever these videos are worth to you. I do post exclusive content over there that's for patrons only. So if you're interested, please go over to guitardiscoveries.com. You're going to find my Patreon link there, along with over 100 videos, so you can just get your fill of guitar, vocal, and recording inspiration. 
Thank you so much. Keep the faith and keep the music playing.